Hi, I'm Mike from Hackaday. We're here at the Super Conference and I'm speaking to Kristen Paget. Kristen, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Mike. Thanks. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for being here with us and for giving your talk last night. I really enjoyed it. So, we're going to talk about some IoT security. Um, not your normal talk. Um, we're going to talk about three devices. Uh, one of them has been redacted. I made a deal with the vendor that they'd patch it in exchange for no zero day being dropped. Um, so we're going to talk about each of these three devices. I'm going to walk you through an attack scenario. So each of these I've, I've compromised in some way, and I want to walk you guys through it. But, but we're not really interested in what the vulnerabilities are, in what the, the fixes are. That's, that's kind of obvious stuff. What I'm more interested in and what I want you guys to take away is what are the universal laws of IoT security? Thank you. Um, I really found it fascinating that you were able to get your hands on a carrier grade cell phone base station or antenna? What was that? The, the technical term for it is an LTE e node B. Um, you can think of it conceptually as the device that uh, connects the antennas to the backhaul. Okay. So it, it does all of the modulation and, and uh, interesting parts of the, uh, the LTE specification. Is this the first time you've gotten to dig into carrier grade equipment? Yeah, I've been working with cellular for a long time. A lot of different handsets. I've, I've been building cell towers for some time. Um, I saw this thing come up at a, a vendor at DEF CON and, and it was kind of one of those no-brainers <laughs> that like, you, you see this kind of equipment come up for sale so infrequently, I just I had to have it. And I think the way that you presented um, your exploration so far on it were very interesting. Like you challenged the audience, like look at this dump out of the serial port and tell me if you can spot the same thing. I really like that presentation because it pulls people in and says like, you can do this too. Um, how far into the exploration process have you gotten with the hardware? Um, not very far. I've, I've actually spent a lot longer so far um, just mapping out the pins. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had to replace the power connector because it was using a, a strange connector on there. Um, really, I've just been mapping out the hardware, uh, the, the, the initial stages of kind of exploration. Um, I've identified three systems on it. Um, one, I've managed to root completely through that boot vulnerability I described. Um, a second one, I have absolutely no idea what it is, what it does, what the credentials are for it. And then I have a third one that uh, it speaks IP and ICMP, but refuses TCP. Huh. It does not appear to speak TCP <laughs> at all. So no idea what that is, possibly a DSP, but there's, there's certainly a lot of ground left to cover in the thing. What are some of your future hopes? Like what kind of functionality might you get out of this? So there's, there's a couple of things that I, I'd love to do with the hardware. Um, if I can find enough credentials in it to, to you know, make a connection back into the SS7 network, <laughs> ultimately I'd love to put this thing on my roof and set up a roaming agreement with T-Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> That, that could be fun. I, I don't know how likely that is, but you know, even if I can just get the thing speaking LTE and have my own LTE base station, that would be that would be fun. It, it strikes um, me as like the cellular equivalent of having solar panels on your roof and selling it back to the power company. Somewhat, yes, <laughs> yes, not dissimilar, not dissimilar. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is it's it's a massively powerful software-defined radio. Mm -hmm. So I've got four channels, which I think are either 50 megahertz or 100 megahertz wide. Um, I've got around 100 watts of power amplification per channel. It's just, it's the best SDR I've ever come across. So I just I want to reverse it enough that I can write some FPGA code and uh, you know decimate some bandwidth. Do you just run that with GNU Radio, or, or do you have another platform in mind? At this point, I, I'll run it with whatever works. <laughs> I'm sure uh, you if, can find the people that can answer those questions if you I, need any help. That's... I suspect that plugging it into GNU Radio would have a fairly limited audience. Uh, probably not many of these things floating around. <laughs> it's open source if you can find a copy of the hardware. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I really enjoyed you talking about the Amazon Dash button a little bit and talking about IoT light bulbs. Um, and I, I guess definitely in, in the second case, I look at all of the devices that are out there and I think of it as an embarrassment of riches in bad news for, for IoT. Um, do you think as far as uh, security dangers that we can't fix? Have we really built a deep hole by deploying things that can't be updated? I think yes and no. Um, I mean, obviously these things have shelf lives and they do eventually mm. die, but you've then got a whole new set of problems about, you know, how do you dispose of a device that has no power and has your Wi-Fi credentials in it? <laughs> You know, there's all parts of the life cycle of these. It's not just the updating, but, you know, eventually they, they, they do go away. And I think a lot of companies are just depending on that cycle being kind of the multi-year process of, of renewal for these things, rather than the kind of day-by-day -day security updates that we're used to. And I think with things like this WPA, WPA2 attack coming out, um, that's really going to change the game because that immediately gives people access to the, the Wi-Fi networks of, of 
a lot of these IoT devices. And you know, when you don't have an update mechanism, you're pretty much permanently in the hole. So if a bad guy wants access to your homeland, he can get it. The question is how much value is that to him? Mm -hmm. Now, what about devices that do have an update mechanism but require the user to know there's an update and to have the technological skill to do the update? That's the thing. If it's, if it's not easy enough that your grandmother can do it, then it's not easy enough. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. Um, a lot of the time, you just have to do it in the background and just not expose it to the users at all. Otherwise, people just don't know what the implications are of clicking those buttons, so they don't do it. I think, you know, over the, like the last 10 years, there's been a ton of effort to make um, building things with Wi-Fi on them easier. And now it's super cheap and super easy. Everything has Wi-Fi. Um, it seems like maybe the next frontier for a lot of device manufacturers is to make everything cellular connected because then it can be configured by the manufacturer um, to get onto any network they want. The user doesn't have to configure a Wi-Fi access point and, and if their connection is spotty, they don't have to deal with that. What do you think the implications are of shipping things that are, can connect to a network anywhere in the world? Um, well, obviously, you know, it changes the threat model of am I offline in this situation? You know, am I broadcasting my data in a situation that I don't want to? But in actual fact, uh, cellular connectivity tends to be a lot more secure than Wi-Fi because, like you said, the credentials are pre-supplied by the carrier. It's all stored in that SIM card, so you've got a good root of trust there. Um, roots of trust are very difficult in IoT. Like, you know, a lot of people complain that IoT devices don't present SSL on their websites, but the question is, if you've got that SSL certificate on the device and the device doesn't have a real-time clock, how does it know when its certificate has expired? You know, there's all kinds of kind of, you have to have crypto to protect the crypto, which is protecting the crypto, kind of layers of protection, and it just, it goes nowhere. So cellular is a great way to get around that because ultimately you end in the SIM card, which is a, a pretty strong route of trust. Yeah, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. So you would actually recommend that, um, if companies are thinking security first, they might consider um, if cellular fits their need. I would certainly trust cellular a lot more than I would uh, a, a typical Wi-Fi network nowadays. As long as you're using a decent protocol, I mean, discard 2G, that's, that's old and busted, but a lot of the networks have turned off their 2G networks now, so that's less of an issue. But yeah, as long as you've got a decent uh, 3G or LTE connection, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to get your backhaul. So I was really um, just so pleased that you were able to come and speak at the Super Conference this year. Thank you for that. I see in, in past history, companies and, and small startups that are making hardware are more interested in getting it out there and seeing if there's a market for that than they are in thinking about the ramifications of what happens if it is widely adopted. Um, and so we have this security second or last or not at all um, type of mentality. Yeah. I think getting um, people like yourself who are great experts in the field to, to speak about it is a good way to get the knowledge out there. But I'm wondering, what do you think a responsible approach is for developing new hardware, um, knowing that it needs to be tested in the market, but then also keeping, you know, as a first protocol, security and make sure that the users, the company, and the networks are all protected? So really the golden rule is to make sure that you can update the firmware. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you have a good firmware update mechanism in the field, it doesn't matter what other security issues you come across because you can patch them. If you don't have a good firmware update mechanism or if, if it's too complicated for users to understand, then it doesn't matter what the security bug is. It doesn't matter if you've got default credentials or if you're connecting to an insecure network or opening ports that you don't want. All of those things are patched through firmware. Mm -hmm. So really, that's, that's the most critical thing. And Okay, you know, a lot of products see security, like you said, security third or security fifth more, active, <laughs> more commonly. Um, and and I, I understand that, you know, it's, it's not something that's immediately impactful to companies. So again, I would say as long as they've got a good security mechanism, they make the product available to the kinds of people who are going to attack it, who are going to take it apart and find out what all of those bugs are and then give that feedback back to the company. That's actually a fairly good way for, for, for companies to bootstrap their own security. It can be a little embarrassing, like folks don't necessarily <laughs> like having zero day dropped on them, but it's, it's a reasonable feedback mechanism. Mm -hmm. Well, great. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure.